A few months ago, I made a video where I tore apart this cheap watch from Menards. I think they're down to like $6 now. And I was able to use the screen with an Arduino. It's a ST7789, 240 by 240. So I've got the screen broken out here onto this uh, board. And then I've connected it to a dev board that I've wired up. This dev board has the ATtiny 1614 microcontroller, which we've talked about in another video. Got my programmer here. And I've got a LiPo charging circuit and a little tiny LiPo battery. This is actually the same battery that came from that watch. So for $6, you get a battery, a screen, and a little rumble motor. So I've connected this up to the screen. I've also added a 32768 kilohertz, well, I'm sorry, 32768 hertz crystal for a real-time timer. So what I'm gonna do is try to make a watch using just these components. This is obviously the breadboard version. Once I know that it works, I could probably order a little circuit board from PCB and make it fit right behind the behind the glass. Let's get started. So I actually started this project before. I filmed it back in June, I think it was. Yeah, because my thumb was all bandaged in the video. But then when I went to edit it, I realized, oh crap, I had my webcam plugged in, so all the audio was being recorded with my webcam instead of my headset. And it was it sounded terrible. Like Way, like, you know, if I talk about zero production values, this was like negative 30 production values. It was unusable. Which is kind of weird because I, did, I didn't realize webcam sounded that bad. You know, it doesn't usually sound that bad when I use it for other purposes. Anyway, so I'm happy to start over. So on my second monitor, I've got my giant cheat sheet, which is all the code that I already wrote. All right, so you saw that I had a, a little LiPo on there. I've also got a 3.3 volt regulator, a very small one uh, made by Microchip. Microchip actually makes a lot of... Uh, well, they make other things besides, you know, uh, microcontrollers. Uh, yeah, so something we need to think about with that, if that's 3.3 volts, that's probably going to affect the speed. Oh, what am I? Of course I know it's going to affect the speed. Why am, I being, why am I being coy about it? So we're going to look here on the data sheets. Oh, I just got back from, I uh, went to a flashback horror con yesterday. Not horror con as in the town. Horror convention in Chicago. Uh, they had the new... Uh, Pinball machine, the Halloween pinball machine was there, so I went down just to make, just to do a few double checks before they had people attack it. That's pretty cool. I met, uh, what did I met? I met, uh, oh, Meatloaf. We hung out with him for a while. That was pretty cool. And then also, uh, <laughs> well, this goes, this goes back to the show days, but um, Felix was obsessed with Jeanette Goldstein. So movie, movie fans probably know who she is, but uh, she was like Vasquez and Aliens. Oh, yeah, see. So if we have at least five volts, we can go to 20 megahertz, but if we're all... 2.7 to 5.5, we better limit it to 10, so we're going to have to start with that. That's Jeanette Goldstein. I should get a picture, uh, have her sign a picture for Felix. And then I was like, hello. And I'm like, hey, can you sign this for my friend Felix? She's like, right, it's for your friend Felix. And I'm like, no, it really is. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan too. You know, I, have, I, I, you know I'm know, i a James Cameron fan. Well, he doesn't really care for Avatar, but, but I'm like, no, no, Felix, you know, he's kind of, uh, you know, I'm not going to tell the whole story, but he's had, you know, he hasn't had... He's had some rough times since the show. So I'm like, you know, could you write him a message to Felix and then I'll, I'll mail this to him? And she's like, well, does Felix have a, a sense of humor? I'm like, yeah, yeah, write whatever you want. And so then she, uh, <laughs> she has that line from right before she dies in Aliens where she's like, you were always an a-hole Gorman, but then she changed it to Felix. And I'm like, oh, perfect. I'm sure he'll get that. He's a Gen Xer like me. All right, so we need to change the, um, the clock settings. Oh, so anyway... And so I'm like, okay, Felix, I got the photo. And then he's like, oh, you should ask her about her custom bra store. And I'm like, oh my God, Felix. It's like, first of all, you want me to ask a, a woman about her custom bra business, which is what she does now, by the way. Especially like after these times in some Los Angeles. So, I mean, uh, you know, it might not still be there. But I'm like, okay, Felix, I'll, I'll do, I'll. he's like, yeah, give me a business card. And I'm like, okay, if you Google it and if it's still... If it's still in business, so I'm not being completely douchey by it. I'm like, okay, so if you if you look it up, if the if the if it's still in business, then I'll ask her for a business card. But I'm not gonna ask her for a business card if her company got closed in the last year. And he's like, Oh yeah, it's still in business. So I'm like, oh great. But then I kind of forget to do it, right? So then it's after the show and we're uh, we're at the bar and I'm waiting in the beer line and I realize she's right in front of me. And uh, it's really funny, there's a guy in front of her and she was talking to him. And there was two conventions at once. There was like a sports memorabilia convention in the Horicon. And so she's talking to the guy in front of her and, and uh, he's like, oh, what are you here for? And she was being like very, um, 
I was like, I mean, she was saying, oh, you know, I just kind of like these things, you know, I, I like it. And then, and then I was like, oh my gosh, the guy doesn't, you know, he doesn't know who she is. And I didn't, I mean, I was, I just thought that, okay, we need the CCP register. I don't, I don't think I'd really want to call a register that <laughs> if I was in charge of the chip. Uh, and so, but I think eventually she mentioned that, you know, she was in some movies and stuff. So anyway, after that guy got his beer, she turns around while she's waiting for her martinis and she's like, oh, it's you because I had like this crazy hat on. So she remembered me and I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, oh, by the way. And then I, <laughs> I asked her and she's like, oh yeah, we're doing really well. She's like, we actually opened a fourth store right at the beginning of the unprecedented events. But she says they're all doing really well now. And they have one in Atlanta and three of them in Los Angeles. And I'm like, okay, do you have a business card? And she's like, oh, I don't have any on me. And I'm like, okay. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to stop embarrassing myself. So Felix, never, never say I don't, never say I didn't do anything for you. I tried. <laughs> so what we need to do is we need to change the speed of the clock. So I'm going <laughs> to, after that completely, completely off topic story. Uh, yeah, she was, she was pretty nice. Okay, so we're going to put this one-time value into the CCP register. That means, okay, we have like four clocks to change something. And then we're going to go clock control, master clock control equals blah, 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 blah. Okay, what do those numbers mean? So this is where you get like in the, uh, the bit dividers and stuff. Well, not really the bit dividers. Okay, that's going to be this one here. All right, so we, we have two fields here. We have PDIV, three down to zero, and then PEN. The PDIV is the scalar type. And then the bit on the end, the LSB, is the prescalar enable. So if you were to set this register to zero, which I believe is the default, um, there would be no prescalar enabled, which means there'd be no division, which would give you 20 megahertz. But we want 10, so we need to put a bit here. And then we also have to have the bit for divide by two, which is zero here. So that's, if you think about it, that's how that works, because if there's a zero here and there's a zero here, nothing happens. But if there's a one here and a zero here, then it goes to the first division, which is division of two. This is completely stupid. So I, I bit shifted zero, one to the left, which means nothing. And then I ordered it with one. Enable prescaler and divide by two, 10 megahertz. Yeah, Meatloaf was, uh, Meatloaf was, he was, he was pretty nice. I mean, he's kind of an old guy now. He's lost so much weight, but we were talking to him because Charlie knows uh, the event coordinator, so we were able to do that. And and earlier in the day, I'm like, Charlie, if we get to meet Meatloaf, I'm going to ask him about his special on the Lifetime channel. And Charlie's like, oh, no! This is spooky, Charlie. And it's... <laughs> so you can Google this. You might not... There's a, there's a series on the Hallmark channel. I believe it's Hallmark channel. It's Hallmark or Lifetime. It's called The Haunting of Blank. And it's basically they find these celebrities that had ghostly encounters in their past and then they ask them about them and then they like they'll take them back to the place so there's actually one called the haunting of meatloaf it's a real thing that does exist and it was like this recording studio which is like up in the mountains it's like a old house or something where they made bad out of hell one apparently there was a lot of ghosts there and they accosted him or or whatever i mean maybe it was ghosts maybe it was other sundries from the 70s <laughs> is that youtube acceptable uh, anyway, but I asked him about it, and then he's like, "Oh man, let me tell you." So I had this theory, like, like if you want to, if you want to really get a celebrity going, you don't talk about what they do; you talk about something they like. Like if you, like if there's like, "Oh look, it's it's William Shatner." You don't ask him about Star Trek; you ask him about horses, right? That's what gets them going. And so anyway, he's telling the whole story back to us, <laughs> and uh, it's kind of funny because then he's like, "Oh yeah," and then the door started opening, and I was like, "Ah!" And then Jim comes in, and, and he's like, are you okay? And I'm like, whoa, you mean Jim Steinman? And he's like, yeah, of course it was Jim Steinman. And I'm like, wow, this is so cool. <laughs> yeah, so he, he was pretty cool. I didn't get much programming done there because I was just talking about this the whole time. So what should we do first? Well, we should probably get the screen working first. Oh, yes, SREG, the special register. This one's kind of cool. This is kind of, well, most CPUs usually have a register with a bunch of flags. Well, let's click on it. It's probably... Okay, this is what we need, global interrupt enable bit. We're going to need that when we actually do the real-time clock stuff. But it's got half carry, sign flag, two's complement, overflow flag. So when math is occurring on a chip, especially an 8-bit chip like this that only has 8 bits, these bits will be set. So like if you add 200 to 200, the carry bit in this register would be set, and then you would know that you overflowed, and then you could 
basically use those two results to figure out what the total is, even though it doesn't fit into eight bits. So compilers would definitely check this sort of, well, I'm sorry, machine language would check this sort of thing when it's doing math. But anyway, we just need the global interrupt enable. So we're gonna go up and we're gonna go s reg equals uh, 80 hex, which is the MSB. I was only there for a day because I was just basically there for tech support, but it was, this is gonna sound kind of, <laughs> kind of egotistical, but it was actually nice being in the convention where nobody knew who I was. So I could just walk around and talk to people and no one, if I wanted to sit there and talk to someone, I could, but no one just randomly came up to me and, and talked to me. So it's not that I don't like talking to people, but sometimes it creates what I call convention quicksand and you get stuck and then it kind of limits what you can do. So it was, it was kind of nice. Uh, I became nobody like Bob Odenkirk. Oh, we're actually doing our first, uh, Bad, well, we've had a few small bad movie nights, but we're actually doing one with like more than two people tonight. We're going to watch Space Jam 2, which I'm sure is terrible, and Twisted Pear, a Neil Breen film. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I think Felix is like biking across the country like uh, Forrest Gump right now. It depends by CPU or microcontroller, but sometimes you have to... Some microcontrollers, if you set up a device like a spy bus, which I'm doing here, it will automatically make the directions of the pins what you need need, need them need them to be. But in this device, you actually have to set up the direction. So if we have uh, clock out, uh, MOSI, master out, slave in, we actually have to set a one there for both of those. Otherwise, they won't work. So what I did was I went to the pin out. And this is what we got right now. And then we're like, okay, well, here's the pins. What pins are used for the spy device? So you just go to IO multiplex into considerations. Uh, now here, uh, these are the variants. We're using the SOIC uh, 14 pin. So see how a lot of them aren't populated. So we see that master out slave in is PA1 and clock is PA3. And we don't need the input because we're just going out to the chip. There's also a uh, chip select. But, uh, on this one, the chip select is not automatically controlled by hardware, so we might as well just do that manually. Okay, so spy zero control A equals, we're gonna set it up as master mode, which means the microcontroller is sending, or the microcontroller is pulsing the clock. That's really what it's about, is which, which one controls the clock. And then it's basically sending bits out to the slave device, which will be the screen. We're going to enable it. And then this one, I'm not so sure about. This is, this is basically, you can do a 2x multiplier on the speed. I'm not sure if that's still, uh, uh, Kosher prudent. Kosher prudent. George Bush has become Jewish? Old George Bush. Oh, wait, no, he became dead. The MSB of the data word is transmitted first. That's normal. So that's, we'll just leave that. Master slave select clock double. When this bit is written to one, the spy clock, which is a serial clock frequency after internal prescaler is doubled in master mode. <sighs> of course, we're, all, we're also going to try to save power because we're going to run this off a of battery. So, okay. Oh, after internal. Okay, so here's the internal prescaler. Okay. So if we set this to div four, okay, so let, oh, okay, so let's say we're running at 20 megahertz. The minimum is a div four, which is five megahertz, but then this bit would double it to 10 megahertz. That would be 10 megahertz per bit. So if you think about it with math, uh, 10 megahertz per bit, so that would be uh, 10, well, 10 million bits a second, put that divided by eight, that would be 1.250 million bits per second. But there isn't a start frame, so you don't lose anything there. Uh, yeah. So uh, why is that important? Well, okay, so let's talk about the screen, right? So let's grab another one, and this probably will come up. We're probably not gonna have a very good refresh rate with this, but that's okay, because it's a watch. Okay, 240 times 240. There's that many pixels. It's two bytes per pixel, because it's 16-bit color. That is 115, 200 pixels that need to be sent out. Best case, we might get 10 frames a second. It probably wouldn't even be that good because there's other, again, there's other things we have to do. All right, let's add a file. Let's go to add a new item. I don't think I want it to be an assembly file. LCD, I'll just call it LCD. Whoop. C file, we're also going to want an H file for that existing item so come on ben add new item oh that went off the side of the screen capture so who knows what i just did i could have clicked anything you would never know okay now 
what I did was I went online and I found some drivers for this. I mean, again, this is a very common LCD, ST7789. Um, Adafruit has drivers. You can find drivers on GitHub. But really, you just send pixels to it. The main important thing that you need are the commands. So what I'm going to do is over here in the H file. Well, first of all, uh, let's include that. Include. You know what? Let's let's be really let's be really pedantic about this. Drivers. Dot LCD. Come on, Ben. Drivers LCD H. Now these drivers aren't very big, so they are mini drivers. I'll be here all week. Try the veal. Okay, so in the H file. So if it's defined, which. Uh, yes. Okay. So if it's defined, let me just grab this over here. All right. So what they'll, what they'll, here's what they'll do. Usually, it's pretty common. You'll have all the main commands that you need to set up the screen. So you have the height and the width, the start position, delay, uh, in, out, reset, address control. And how it works is it's, you know, it's done via spy, but you'll send one command and possibly some operands. So there'll be an op, op code, an operational code, which will be one of these. And then there may or may not be operands after it. And that sets up a certain condition like, oh, I'm going to write memory. Then after you send that, then there's this one of the one of the IO on the screen is actually command or data. So if you send in a command, you put that, I believe it's low, and then you send the command, then you change that to high. And then the next time you write to the spy bus, it'll be putting data into memory. Let's just do what everybody else does. I just, I just, let me be clear, I stole this off of GitHub. And since this was like a month ago when I started, I don't remember where I got it from. So what this does, uh, it basically, it's a big group of commands and that will basically send these all in a row to the LCD. And the numbers here, these are operands and also delays, it has a 10 millisecond delay. So basically by putting this all into an array, you just spit the data over and put in the delays, you, you know, you detect for the delays. Uh, and then that should set up the screen. Limit, baby, I would never do you wrong, and I would never make your heart blue. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, let's see. All right, so this is display init. So this is going to just run through that array and send the commands, and then that should set up the screen. Now, since I copy pasted this from other code, there's a few things missing. There's CS low, delay arguments, milliseconds, uh, and then CS high, DC high. So let me grab those as well. And we'll just put all of these in the LCD driver. That way it's nice and neat. Go ahead, kid, jump. A suicide will be nice and neat. They're going to trace that gun, Biff. Kid, I'm Donald Trump. <laughs> There's at least three movies back then that had Donald Trump in it. You had Back to the Future 2. Then you had Gremlins 2. Or he was like Trump slash Ted Turner. And then... Um, was it? Oh, Batman Returns. It's like, I am Max Shrek. I don't like the Batman. Also, this movie isn't really that good. Yes, I'm the geek who doesn't like Batman Returns. All right, check this out. So we got write command and we got write data. So there's two different ways we can do this. We also have to create a, uh, we have to put these primitives into the H file. So write command, see how DC low, command select low, send the data, command select high. Oh, I'm sorry. DC low is the command line and CS low is the chip select. And then the other one is write data. Let me grab that from over here. It's almost exactly the same except for DC high. So basically, yeah, when DC, when this particular pin is low, that means we're writing a command. When it's high, it means we're writing data. And then we do the same thing regardless. We could probably compress this a little bit more, but all right, send spy. Okay, send spy should just use a register, so we shouldn't have to bring in anything else. Okay, so we're basically going to put the we're going to pass in the data, put the data into the register, and then we'll wait for it to be sent out. Now there are some things we could probably do to speed this up, but well, well, make it work first and then make it fast. Delay arg milliseconds. All right. Oh yeah, I I, I ran into some things like if you use the default delay library with um, you know with uh, Atmel Studio it will actually cause a, an error. I think it's using one of the timers that I intend to use for something else. So I actually had to uh, find my own solution. And by find, I mean, that's right. I stole it. Uh, but this is normally what happens in a delay loop. It just does some inline uh, assembly. Oh, delay loop. Oh, delay loop two must be a, f oh yeah, delay loop two is a function 
in the system. Uh, I just I needed to use this because otherwise, if you use the built-in one, the way it passes data, I think it's the data is not the right type, and also it causes an issue with the timer. I wish there was an easy way to like create the H primitives. There probably is, but I don't know what it is. You've exceeded your uh, daily allowance of, <laughs> of meatloaf references. Well, two out of three of the references weren't bad. You ever seen the video for uh, Rock and Roll Dreams Come Through, which I hate to break this to you, radio DJs, but it was one of the other songs on Bad Out of Hell too. We needed to find the free, uh, frequency of the CPU for the timer to work. So we're going to go with 10 megahertz. And we also need to include the delay library so that delay two thing can be referenced. That should make it work. But anyway, that's the one where it's like, uh, there's always something magic. Ooh. There's always something true dun, dun, dun. And when you really, really need it the most That's when rock and roll dreams come through Not true, through Anyway, the video uh, It's like one of the very first appearances of Angelina Jolie Back when she ate sandwiches Oh man, life is a lemon and I want my money back Okay, display init zero We've got that one So that's going to send all the commands over Right command, right data. Set address, set set address window fill area. Okay, we need to. I need to pull these commands over. The set address window basically sets up what pixels can be filled by the uh, write process that comes right after it. And the thing that's uh, kind of neat about it is it. Uh, I can write the well, not write the code more efficiently. I can make the this video more efficient, except for the part where I talked about Meatloaf and Jeanette Goldstein for 10 minutes. All right, so set address window. So this 0, 0, uh, X, X0, zero, Y0, zero, X1, Y1. So you basically say, okay, I want to, the data I'm about to send, I'm going to start it here, and the maximum fill is here. So that's going to be the whole screen, basically. But the thing that's cool about that is you can, uh, you can set up like squares of data anywhere you want on the screen, and then if you continue to write, the data will, like, let's say you, you, only, you only want to write the first 10 by 10 pixels. You don't have to worry about um, counting the bit order. By setting that 10 by 10 window, you just send 100 bytes and it fills up that window. It doesn't, like, continue scrolling to the right. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Oh, yeah, this is that, okay, this is the thing we're trying to speed things up. Oh, I think this does work, but this is only for the full screen, so... You may have to come back and double check this part. All right, uh, here I've created a loop. Uh, wall one, we're going to set the address window basically to the start every time. We're going to fill with colors, which is a 16-bit value, by the way. And we're going to fill up 57,600 pixels plus one. For some reason, you have to add one at the end. I don't know why. Increment the colors uh, register, because if you just increment it by one, the change won't be very noticeable. And then delay one. Well, 1,000 milliseconds. Okay, let's send it over and see if it works. Cool, there's some colors changing on the screen. Let's get these colors out onto a screen. Nice. I want to talk about what I'm doing here with fill area. See how I've added this register change? Uh, control B equals buffer enable and SSD BM. Uh, that stands for bit mask. So what you can do is you can actually, there's a, there's a two byte buffer. I believe it's in and out on the spy device. Buffer mode enable and then buffer mode wait for receive while we're not receiving, we're only sending. All right, this will enable two receive buffers and one transmit buffer. Okay, well think about it this way. So you put a byte into the register, and then once that byte is there, the register then clocks it out to the device. And then what you normally do, you like wait for that clock out to be complete. And you see that with uh, send spy here. See, while it's waiting for it to be complete, you just basically do nothing. But we can speed that up if we enable the dual buffer mode. We can put a byte in, and then we'll wait for that byte to be put into the transmit shift register. Not necessarily shifted out yet, but put into the transmit shift register. And then once, once it's been put there, then we can put the next byte in. Think of it like this. Like, let's say, okay, so this, this is your data in, and then transmit... And that goes to bits out. So what we're doing is like, okay, we put the data in there. And then once the hardware has copied this data byte into the transmit byte, then this flag will trigger, which means this is empty. And then we can put the next byte into that slot. 
while the previous byte is still being clocked out, which will give us a little bit of a speed advantage. That's why we did it. However, that really only works, well, without more complicated code, that only works with a pair of bytes, which is what happens when we're filling the pixels, because remember, it's 16 bits per pixel. So after we're done, we set it back to normal mode, so that when we do other commands, like set address window, see how we're just sending single byte commands, that won't be screwed up. I mean, we're probably only gonna be updating the display when it's turned on and then when the minutes change, which will also save power. So like just the fact that we're not clocking bits to the screen will save power. These embedded systems, I mean, I'm not even getting close to the craziness that usually goes on. Like they do everything they can to possibly save power. That's why it kind of bothers me when it's like, oh, you know, we got to make things more efficient and green. It's like engineers have been doing that since the dawn of time. All right, we've got some color on the screen. Now let's uh, make this into a watch, or at least the basics of a watch. Uh, there's a peripheral on here called the real-time counter. Uh, so basically a 16-bit counter, but it's used for timing purposes, as in like timekeeping. Okay, it counts pre-scaled clock cycles in a register and compares the content of the register to a period timer and a compare register. And it can generate interrupts. So the reference clock is typically 32768 hertz. Uh, the reason they use that number, uh, let's go over here, let's go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay, so a 15 bit number gets you up to uh, 32,767. So what happens is um, if, you're, if you're running a counter at that frequency, once you pass the threshold and add one more number, uh, boom, now you've basically overflowed the 15-bit timer, and you've counted one second. Uh, and so, therefore, uh, that crystal oscillator frequency is very common, used just for that purpose. Now you might say, oh, why can't I just run a timer at full speed, 20 megahertz or 10 megahertz, and then count up? Well, that would require a lot more logic to decode, and that's yeah, kind of pointless. <laughs> also, you know, you can't, you can't necessarily do the logic at the same speed at, as the timer, I mean, even though it's an AVR, it does things in one clock cycle. An operation often takes more than one clock cycle. Uh, it might be one clock cycle per operation in assembly, but just trying to like, compare a number and boom, you can use it a couple cycles. Right here, we attached a 32 kilohertz uh, crystal to these two pins. And then we have a, a 22 puff cap on each side going to ground. Now this does eat up two pins, but it will give us an accurate clock. I did some testing with this before there is an internal 32 kilohertz oscillator and it says that it's 32768 but in my test it actually was just 32 so you'd have a clock that runs uh, slightly fast and also the internal crystals aren't always as accurate as external crystals and as far as timekeeping goes we want it to be precise okay so we're going to use the periodic interrupt timer uses the same clock source and can generate an interrupt request or a level event on certain clock periods, and of course we're gonna want 32768. So once it counts that number, it will call and interrupt. All right, so let's set it up. I guess we could put it after the main code if we wanted. So I actually used atmel start just to generate this part because it doesn't always tell you exactly what the ISR should be called, like, or at least this particular uh, vector number. Well, actually, maybe it does. Maybe I'm just being, well, here, let's take a look. Let's grab that. I don't know, sometimes using start is a good way to... Sheet's not the right word. Yeah, see that that phrase doesn't appear anywhere in the data sheet. Because remember, the data sheet doesn't know what language you're using. You know, assembly or C, it, it basically just talks about registers. Um, so we'll clear the interrupt. So whatever we do, we'll do it right here. So let's go up and create static volatile hours equals zero. Static volatile minutes equals zero. Oh, I suppose I should probably define what these are. I'll just use a U and eight for all of them. <clears throat> oh, we had our uh, first group bad movie night last week. Well, since things. Oh, yeah, we watched uh, Space Jam 2, which was even worse than I expected. And then we watched our first Neil Breen movie. Neil Breen is kind of like this um, prolific bad filmmaker. Uh, most of the YouTube uh, movie people talk about him. He's like one of those like weird like narcissist people who makes movies where he's like, 
he's like, oh, I am a super AI from the future or something like that. And I don't know, he's like a 60-year-old man. And Oh, my gosh, that movie was hilarious. <laughs> All right, so every time this gets called, uh, let's do this. If seconds equals 60. If minutes <laughs> equals 60. Reset. Now let's just, we'll just do military time for now. Okay, that'll give us a 24 hour clock. Nice. Now we need to set up the interrupt. I mean, set up the conditions that allow it to be triggered. I'll do this right at the start. Uh, we need to change another protected register, so we're going to put in that variable again. And this is going to be clock control for the external 32 kilohertz register. So I believe that's under clock control. Okay, so clock control, then it's the, okay, all right. And then clock control underscore enable bit mask. So that's going to enable the external crystal. So you can't just hook it up. You have to say, okay, that crystal is there. So the pin multiplexers will actually, instead of using those pins as I.O., it'll pipe it in and use it as a clock source. And it's crystal, not a crystal oscillator. There is a difference. So the crystal oscillation... Uh, well, you know, crystal is actually like a little piezo. You actually have to kind of like hit it with um, electricity in order to make it vibrate at the right frequency. Um, so that that's done inside of the chip. So let's say, oh, I'm going to create a new project. Okay, great. And then it's on the <clears throat> 1614. Great. And then we're just going to go down here and add a real-time clock. Then when we create the project, blah, 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 blah. Should appear as a module. Yeah, well, we're not using the timer and compare, but uh, so we can say, okay, pit enable, clock selection, external crystal oscillator. Um, yeah, and then we'll, and I'll include the ISR in the harness. And then when you view the code, you can go in and see what it did. See? And this can basically show you how to set it up or. It tells you how to set it up, you know, in the data sheet, but this will, you know, help you figure out the little ins and outs of it. So that's what I use to kind of uh, get a head start from Atmel Start on how the code will work. So, so copied from that, and I have this. Okay, so RTC control A register. We're going to set the prescalar div by one, which is no division, so it'll run at 32768 hertz. Then we're going to enable it and then also allow it to run in standby mode because we are going to put this chip to sleep to save energy. Then we select the external oscillator. We wait for the synchronization, which is kind of a thing that happens in uh, ARM chips a lot, but I guess it happens here too. All right, we're going to add the uh, pin control A clock control and also enable it. We're going to enable the periodic interrupt. So you could, like, let's say you wanted this, you know, you still wanted it to run a, a 32768. You could use a different compare register. Like, let's say you wanted it to be, I don't know, like 100 milliseconds or something. So in the pit, or I'm sorry, in the real-time counter, let's grab the registers right here, register summary. Yeah, so you would set it to compare, and then you would set the value in here, in, into this register, what you want it to be. So we're using 72768. But you could, well, let's see, this is a 16-bit value, so you can fit that number. But you could put a different value in there if you wanted to count to a different number and also trigger an interrupt. But we're using it basically in the best way that we can for it to be a clock. How do we know if it's working? We'll just come down here and we'll go if seconds. So basically, if seconds is greater than zero, we'll reset it to zero so it keeps triggering. And then we'll put this code in its place. Notice how we are not copying over the, the, the delay because we don't need that anymore. All right, let's see if it works. Hey, uh, here's a good idea. Maybe I should include interrupts. <laughs>
Oh, I always count one one thousand too slowly. Does that look like a second to you? Well, I very serendipitously uh, pushed start fairly accurately to the change, so yeah, it looks like it's working. Cool. Okay, now that we have the timer working, let's put some numerals on the screen. Call this graphics. H. Swell. Let me see, we'll want to include this on the main file. You excommunicated by a group of psychopaths. And you betrayed us, Bruce. I am the League of Shadows. Everyone is always the thing, like, I am the League of Shadows. I am the Senate. It's always, it's always, I guess that just goes with megalomania. Constant. Int 8. Um, glyphs. Yeah, I think I have the word glyph is always so, oh, what's the right word? Pretentious. Uh, text. <laughs> okay. So let's do some defines and the time warp again. All right. So let's define these in binary. Okay. So obviously that's eight bits. Uh, I guess we could just do it eight by eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then we'll do eight of those and then we'll draw in the characters. We'll just start with like a single digit. A lot of the old school fonts on computers, um, a big part of their design was making sure that they looked okay on crappy NTSC monitors. Um, if you've ever, I don't know, was it 8-Bit Guy or somebody else that does the videos talking about like how Apple II graphics work. Well, Apple II graphics basically, um, oh wait, I can't do that because then it's, if it takes up all eight, it's going to overlap. So I've got to, I'll just remove that. There we go. Can you see the eight? Can you see the picture? Of course, I need to have the bottom. Anyway, uh, how the Apple II did graphics is it basically tricks the uh, NTSC color burst phase into displaying, I guess you could call them pseudo colors. And it would do that by having bit patterns of like, oh, I don't know, like that versus that versus that. And then they also had a control bit. So I think it was like, one byte, but one of the bits was kind of like a palette or a control bit. So like if you had B1 and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or B0, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, yeah, so the first one wouldn't actually appear in the screen. The actual data on the screen would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, which means the screen memory was <laughs> was kind of divided into, uh, divided by seven horizontally. That's why if you play um, an Apple II game on a monochrome monitor, a lot of the graphics will look like vertical, well, all of them will look like vertical lines. And those lines were used to trick color into being. Okay, so conversely, the other, you know, other computers that weren't trying to do that, if they had the fonts, if the fonts had thin characters, like if there was a wall that was only one pixel wide, that would also have the same effect of generating a false color. And they didn't want that. And you you can kind of see that too if you look at like the text or like the NTSC text on an old monitor, like the edges of a font will look kind of, you know, they'll appear to have color. Well, they won't appear to have color. They will have color. And that's why. Obviously, that's not an issue here. But uh, we still want to like, you know, we still want to make sure it's nice and thick and chunky. Now, later on, we can actually say, okay, you know, Obviously, this is going to be, zeros be transparent, but what color one represents, that could also change. But we just want the bit patterns for now. Draw text. The char, which will be an index. Well, I mean, that'll be an ASCII number, right? So we'll just do some math to it to index it to our array of dots. Start X. Start Y. And uh, you know what? Let's just build scale right into it. We'll just pass it as zero. So for now, we won't uh, do index math here. All right, so it's going to be, well, it's eight by eight. So we need to have a couple for loops. For int, I'm sorry, int y equals zero. Remember, this is separate from the y start and whatever. So this is just a counter of how many pixels we've drawn. Okay, and then inside of that, You'll be completely shocked to know that we'll need a vertical version. Int x, x minus 8, x plus plus, 
X plus plus is like a, uh, what's that thing called? C plus plus, which this isn't. This is just C, C minus minus. <laughs> that was dumb. Okay, set address window. So it's going to be from where it goes to where it ends. 240 by 240, so that fits inside of a byte, so that's good. So we're going to start at start X and start Y. That's the upper left corner. And then how far we go to the right and down, I guess, would depend on our scale. So what we're going to do, we're going to, 64 times, we're going to set an address window and then fill it up with color. So it'll be like a grid. The scale would probably actually mean size, to be more correct. Okay, so then the lower right-hand corner would be start X plus size, start Y plus size. Although that's not exactly correct because we, yeah, because that would change every time. But we could put the math on the screen, like it would be start X plus the position that we indicated. So it would be, well, that's not, no, it'd be time size. Oh no, but that's multiplication. We don't want to do that. I don't think this thing has a multiplier. So I think we should do this a little more intelligently. Start Y is going to continually go down the screen. So after we draw one line, we could take start Y and increment it by size. So if you're drawing five by five blocks, you draw five across, then you drop down five. Yeah, that would work. Okay, uh, so we're just going to use this Y as basically a counter. As far as the horizontal is concerned, we have to reset start X every time. Start X plus, well, it would be start X plus size times X. But again, that's math. I'm going to try to avoid that, just like I did in school. Uh, how about this? X pos equals start X. We'll do eight loops. And then we'll do that. And then every time we draw a box, X, X pos plus equals size. And then this would be X pos right there. I think that'll work. Oh, I forgot something rather important. Actually getting the graphics data. Oops. All right, so it'll be text. And we'll just start. Again, we're not doing any multiplication here. Each line, we would get a new line of the character. So let's see, we'll do a temp. Temp equals text. And then we're going to need, I don't think I would call it the, the char. OK. Oh, well, if we use, OK, if we use that, this is going to need to be larger because the index is going to get pretty big. So we're going to make that 16 bit. What we would do, well, it's eight. Well, we could do it right now. So since it's eight bits, we take the char times equals eight. Although the better way to do it is to bit shift it uh, three to the left. Uh, you say, okay, temp. Okay, so then once we, all right, so we set the window. And then we basically say if temp and the MSB, so if there's a, we're going to do MSB first, if there's a bit there, we will fill it with color, else we won't, or else it'll be the background, uh, whatever that is. And then we're going to use the fill area like we did before. Fill area. Uh, I don't know. White. And then how many pixels? Size times size. Uh, well, size doesn't change, so let's pre-calculate that. So we'll do, uh, or just calculate it once. Total picks equals size, come on, size times size. And, is there, is a, and then if there is no pixel there, black. And for each operation, temp, we'll shift it one to the left to make the next pixel ready. So uh, what'll happen, like in this case, it'll be like, okay, if, you know, Black, black, white, 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 black, black. That's exactly how it'll be shifted out onto the screen. Uh, there we go. It's the numeral eight, although it appears to have scan lines. That wasn't intended. Why did that happen? Let's see. 
there I did start y plus equals size minus one. All right, now I need a font. I found this uh, actually from the Marlin website, you know, like the 3D printer code. Bitmap converter, let's see. Good old Atari font. And it actually creates some handy dandy uh, C code that I can just copy. That's, there must be some reason it's doing this. I'll figure it out. I think this should work. Oh, it's because there needs to be a zero in front of the B because that was meant for uh, Arduino, not AVR. So let's try that. Okay, that should work. See, if I look for ones, it highlights all the characters. Ah, uh, shoot, it doesn't work because we need to read the characters like this in a line in memory, but this is striped that way. Ah, uh, shoot. Yeah, I think I'm going to need a different converter program. I guess I could just write one, or I could just keep looking for one. All right, now I have a static character, but it's growing every time the seconds increase. It should reset when it takes up the whole screen. Happy little clouds. Cool. All right, we should have enough now to actually uh, draw the time. So let's do that. Void draw time. It's draw time. Draw two digits. Hours. 96 plus 48. That would be the minutes. Well, actually, let's make it seconds and minutes just so it's... Oh, wait. Uh, actually, no, let's do hours, minutes, and then have the seconds be big. Like like your, your life is ticking away. In the interrupt, I added a flag called sec flag for seconds flag. We'll set it to one. Then in the main loop, if we see that the second flag has tripped, set it back to zero, and then draw the time. So draw time. Uh, so seconds and one, so if it's an odd-numbered second, it'll draw a colon between the numbers, else it won't. Then we have draw hours and draw minutes. Uh, the difference with those is um, if it's uh, if the hour is less than 10, like if it's 9, we don't want it to say 0, 9, we just want it to say 9. So uh, what happens on a 0 character is different uh, for those two functions. That's probably a bit sloppy, I could clean that up later, but it should work. So yeah, let's send it over. Ah, there we go. It's 1.01 o'clock. It, is it p.m.? Is it a.m.? Who knows? You might notice a very slight desynchronization between the semicolon and the uh, number. Uh, that's because, well, I have those functions going and it, you know, it takes time to draw the number. So after it draws the colon, then it draws the seconds, which is why there's a slight delay. Remember, this thing doesn't run very fast. The clock is working like clockwork. I'm going to run a synchronicity test here for a few minutes as opposed to scrantonicity. And we'll uh, see if it keeps pace with my uh, old Android phone. Uh, my early tests with the CPU plus the LCD, obviously the backlight takes probably like 95% of the power. Um, this little LiPo, it's probably, uh, it might be 50 milliamp hours if we're lucky. Um, so let's see, this is, I think it's around 30 milliamps. So yeah, you could probably run this for about one hour with the screen on, which is why, unless you're actually looking at the screen or have the screen on, we'll probably have it asleep the rest of the time. 36 minutes later, it's still synchronized. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a winner, winner, chicken dinner. And remember, the code was starting with minutes set to one, so... Uh, yeah, that's why that's off, but so it's that minus one equals that. All right, so now I guess we should make it look cool on the screen. Yeah, if you look at the output here. Okay, so how fancy can we make this? Well, we've only used 15% of the flash, which I believe is 16K, and only five bytes. You might be thinking, oh, but there's all these variables and, you know, we're passing values to functions and... You know, we've got uh, ints and things. How, how are we only using five bytes? Well, uh, when you compile it, it's going to be using registers for these values because the chip... Oh, it does have a built-in hardware multiplier. Okay. 
multiplying two 8-bit numbers into a 16-bit result. Oh, it does take one extra cycle, but that's, uh, that's not too bad. Well, anyway, um, I don't know if there's... Oh, here we go, here we go. These are the registers, right? Uh, so, wow, there's actually quite a few of them. <laughs> there's like uh, 30 of them. So what it does is it'll actually... These are registers on... I know it's an integrated circuit, you know, it's a microcontroller, but the registers are things built in... If you think of the system, like, okay, you've got... Well, what page is this? 53, okay, where's... the uh, Block diagram, okay. Right, so here's all the crap in the system, right? So you've got flash, you've got SRAM. The registers are in the CPU right there. So not only are they built in, but it's actually faster than accessing the SRAM because you don't have to go through the bus. Uh, you can do it in a single operation, whereas I believe RAM has a one cycle uh, penalty. Right, and then some of these actually uh, work as 16-bit. So you see how you have a low byte and a high byte? So like that multiplication thing that we were just talking about, it probably puts the result into two of these. Uh, yeah, see how they're arranged? I believe the Z80 also does that. So you, you can actually have some 16-bit, rudimentary 16-bit operations happening inside of an 8-bit CPU. Cool. Yeah, so these are basically being used judiciously by the compiler to save actual RAM. 16K, I know that doesn't sound like a lot now, but the older Nintendo games, like Super Mario Brothers, the ones that didn't have mappers, all of the graphics were stored in 8 kilobytes. I wonder if there's a tool online that <clears throat> would convert NAS uh, char ROM files to uh, C or C files, or well, you know, the same thing that we did here, this kind of thing. Yeah, maybe we can make like a cool background or something. So I was thinking, how do we get some graphics on this thing? This screen is 240 by 240, which is very similar to the uh, Nintendo Entertainment System, or just the Nintendo if you're a Gen Xer, the new greatest generation. Resolution, which was 256 by 240. We'd only lose two tiles on the right-hand side. So I thought, oh, that sounds like a perfect candidate for being converted. So let's go to the great site, wikinestdev.com, and take a look at some information. Step. Let's go back one step. The Nintendo has a PPU memory map. That's a picture processing unit. And there's two separate buses on the Nintendo. That's why the cartridge is so wide. One of them's for video, one of them's for data. Yeah, so there's pattern tables and name tables. Name tables is a description in RAM of what characters are on the screen. Like, oh, there's a, that tile's over here, that tile's over there, or this tile is, you know, your score. Pattern table holds the graphics, so to speak. So what I was thinking we can we could do is we could load up an emulator and then basically do a hex dump, copy the data from the patterns and at least one name table and actually recreate the Nintendo graphics on this watch. And then maybe just draw the time in the middle of the screen. Okay, so pattern table. So the Nintendo did use a bit plane graphics, so to speak. So if you have um, like a graphic of Mario, Mario has four colors, well, three colors, one's transparency. And if you think about it, like, look, look here how it's combined. So you've either got zero, one, two, or three. So with bit plane graphics, because bits are just bits, and it's an 8-bit system, we have eight 8-bit entries here. And then immediately following that, we have another eight 8-bit entries. And then what it does is it looks at basically the same positions on each bit plane. So if you've got a one here and a one here, that is one, one. and binary, which means three of those, and that's what actually creates the graphics. Now, this is different from, uh, I don't know, like a Sega Master System, which had chunky pixels. Sega Master System actually had four bits per pixel in the pattern table. So if you had a pixel 15, which would be 1111, you'd see four ones all in a row. It wouldn't be separate out in memory like this. Now, there's some systems like the Amiga and the Atari ST, which use bit plane graphics for the background, and they also did a lot of their sprites and software. In which case, you'd have to do four times the memory access to do one thing, which is kind of slow. Now, the reason this is important is because if we do copy the data directly, this tells us how to reconstitute it. Do you, does something have to have water in it before you can reconstitute it? You ever have like one of those hiker meals, like, what's it called? Like Ridge Mountain, Blue Mountain, Mountain House. It's like one of those dehydrated meals. It's really good, but of course, it's like 9 million percent salt. So the PPU name tables, this is what's actually on the screen. And you can get really into the weeds here with like mirroring and whatnot, but see, see this diagram right here? These are the memory locations. So if there's, if there's RAM in the cartridge, 
you could technically hold four screens worth of data on the Nintendo at one time. And the reason you might need four is if you want to do diagonal scrolling. Yeah, so what we could do, well, well, actually, no, we would, oh, wait, no, 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 we just need one. What we could do, so it says, okay, so 2,000, 2,400, 2,800, 2C00. So we could do a memory dump from uh, 2,000 to uh, 2,3FF, and that would, well, well, with the attribute tables, that would give us everything we need to redraw the graphics. Yeah, and then we could just put it into into the flash memory of the microcontroller as a constant, just like we did with the font. It just might work. Now, there are a few other things we need to think about, which is the attribute tables. But I think we can talk about that more if we load up the emulator. Rockman. Let's look at the PPU viewer, picture processing unit. All right, so see these graphics? Typically, one's used for sprites. Well, not typically, always. One's used for sprites and one's used for background data. So you can see how this one's used to create the characters on the screen. But his face is probably a sprite. All right, so this is uh, 16 by 16 characters each, which is 256 characters. Let's do the math. We talked about being on a bit plane. So we have 256 characters, and each one is 8 pixels tall. Oh, okay, 2048. But there's two bit planes for each one, so multiply that by 2. So it's 4,096 bytes for each one of these. So then we take that and we multiply that by 2. We get 8,000, well, 8 kilobytes, which is the size of the total addressable graphics memory of the PPU. So if you have a game like, a smallest possible game like, uh, like Mario Brothers. Oh yeah, see Super Mario Brothers? 41 kilobytes, roughly 40K. So it's a 32K program ROM plus an 8K character ROM. So you play something like Super Mario Brothers, these graphics never change. Whereas with Mega Man, they would actually have an 8K RAM on the cartridge, one of the reasons cartridges were expensive. And then as the game uh, played, it would actually decompress graphics from the main program ROM and put them into the character ROM as needed. I think we might be able to use this to actually dump some data. And here's the name tables. Yeah, see, if you look at his face, see how it's not colored? They did that with a sprite. All right, so here's Mega Man. Wait, I actually do own Mega Man 1 on cartridge. So I'm totally legit playing this. Here's the name tables. Here you can see the horizontal and vertical mirroring and effect. That's basically how it scrolls. And then, of course, we have our characters here. And this is a gr great example of how cartridge games did actually have to load. Like when Mega Man drops down to the next level, there's a very slight pause. And the uh, enemy graphics will be updated. Like you have like this robot that runs at you that splits into half. You don't see that in the lower stages of the game, so they'll, they'll actually remove those graphics from RAM and then replace them with something else. And they actually will use uh, simple forms of compression, such as RLE, run length encoding, for that. But yeah, this could be this could be a nice background. Like we put like our time right here between the uh, frozen palm trees. All right, so how do we get this data? Let's go up to debug, hex editor. All right, this is the state of the NES. Okay, so let's see, 2,000. So 2,000 should be what's on the screen. 2,000 to 2,400. Now that does include the attribute bytes. Oh yeah, so regarding attribute bytes. So the Nintendo had uh, four palettes for uh, background graphics and four palettes for character. Each palette contains four, four colors, well, one of which is always background, right? Uh, yeah, you can see them down here by the cursor. Right, so it's like, okay, well, which palette is this particular tile? Because if you look here, when I right-click on it, you can see the palette's being changed. And then on the screen here, we can see we have like a light, uh, like a teal palette for the sky, and then like a blue palette for the snow. This is a pretty simple screen. There's only a couple palettes going on. The Nintendo could only define a palette, or they could only change a palette it was two by two uh, blocks or two by two tiles, which is why, if you think like the blocks in Castlevania, <coughs> they were two by two, which was also the minimum size to have the same color. And they usually did tricks in the software or the graphics designs you didn't notice. This is all to save memory, of course. Uh, okay, so if we go in, let's go to view, let's go to the PPU memory, and let's grab everything up to. Oh, wait, no, that's a, that's the tile memory. We can't start there. We have to go to 2,000. Okay. 
Uh, oh, here we go. Okay, so 2,000 up to 2,400, just like that. All right, let's copy that. No, I don't want this. I want a hex editor. Yeah, good old hex editor. Boom, there we go. Uh, yeah, you can kind of see like the middle where there's no sky. See, like where the, well, there is a sky. There's nothing. See how there's kind of nothing there? Kind of sort of see it. Oh, and then look at this. See this where you got all these zeros? So the last, uh, I want to say the last 64, yes, yeah, so the last 64 bytes is actually the color palette. See how this one's very simple. We have like a cloud palette, then we have a tree palette, then we have the ground palette. So the ground palette is palette number zero and see how it's, you know, basically like white, blue, and then dark blue. And then if you look over here, you see that in the first palette, it's like, oh, that's where that came from, right? Oh, it's under name table attributes. Oh, here we go, attribute table. Okay, cool. So this is the whole screen divided. Yeah, and then basically you have two bits for each two by two section, which means one byte actually covers four sections. So again, if we go back into the math of it, wow, this is like really dorky and boring. 32 <laughs> times. 30. So there's 960 basically tiles on the screen. Now you add 64 bytes for the color attributes. That's, oh, exactly 1K. Ah, here's a good example. So see the slightly thicker white line? That indicates one byte. And then inside of it is four pairs of two bits. Oh, I see how they're doing this. So yeah, it's 32 by 30, which means one whole row down here, or two whole rows is missing. But that's okay because there's 64, 64, which is eight by eight. So they're just basically um, ignoring like the last row there. This is, this is the color information. So we could decode that later on. All right, I just got another beer. So apparently I drank four beers so far. So this would be number five. What's this timer doing? So we need to get the pattern table next. So let's go back one, one. So we need 1,000 to one F, 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 F. All right, so let's go back over here. I guess so this is like, oh, uh, can Ben translate Nest Graphics onto a cheap watch from Menards while buzzed uh, video? Some of them might think, oh, Ben, I'm worried about you. You shouldn't drink like that. I'm like, oh, I drink like this all the time. I just don't talk about it. Oh, here we go. Oh, a bunch of zeros to start out. Does that make sense? All of my salesmen, ha uh ha, -huh. zeros. Yeah, that makes sense because look at all that, all that blank spot there. I suck at my job. No, you don't. Yes, I do. My salesmen are slobs. No, they aren't. Yes, they do. Huh? I like to make a sale, but what can I do? I'm going to be a failure just like you, Dad. That's right. I'll be a failure just like you. I'm going to use S Record, which is a command line program to convert these hex files into a C array that I can use. Okay, srec cat. Oh wait, because it's trying to be like Linux. srec cat dot exe. We have our binary file, so let's take Mega Man underscore ice underscore name table hmm. bin. Okay, this is the binary input. The output is name table out C. And the type is an array. Oh, I missed something here. Oh, I have to name it. Okay, so it's going to be a name table array. And I missed something else. Unknown C option. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. I have to apparently have to do that. Okay, there we go. Okay, uh, cool. So create the C file. Nice. So that, in theory, should match 
this. It does. It's just written in a way that we can use with uh, whatchamacallit program. Okay, so that was a name table. Now we're going to do pattern tile. So we'll just do the same thing with pattern tile. Then we can import this into Atmel. I've copied the name table and pattern data into the program. Let's see how much space that takes. It might not include it. No, I don't think it did because I'm not actually referencing it. So it's like, oh, he's obviously not using this. It's 5K. Right, so we go from whatever that was. Uh, so we're, we're going to have to be like 7K total, which is still less than half of what this chip has in Flash. All right. All right, so we need to draw graphics. Well, we kind of already did that. Well, we, No, we just need to do it with a bit plane. Well, a bit plane and a font. So it's not entirely different. So let's grab that. Let's go down here. And I'll call it, uh, you know, and I'm going to call it uh, draw tile. Yeah. Okay. So this is going to be times 16. Just remember, it's two pairs of eight bytes, which is 16 bytes, which means it's a 16x multiplier. Uh, size, size, size and color are, all, are irrelevant. Well, actually, no, palette. We've got our index pointer, which is the char. So we're going to look eight ahead for the second part of it. So we're going to load both of those into a register at once, and then we can use them to actually put our numbers together. That's not very elegant, but whatever. So we need to palletize it. We need to make it palatable. So let's get another temp in here. The color equals. All right. <laughs> We're using the high bit of it. So it's already been shifted. Okay, that should work. Okay. H nibble zero. Bit shift one to the right. Yeah. <laughs> and then the color four equals. Oh, wait, no, no, because we're. We got the thing is, we have two different bytes. We had to combine the bits. H nibble. Oh, yeah, H nibble and. So we'll and it with the MSB like that. Well, actually, we don't even need to do that yet. So H nibble, we'll just do that. And then the color or equals H nibble zero, bit shifted one to the right. Finally, the color and, I'm sorry, and equals, uh, what is that? 12 which is ABC zero. I just remembered all I had for dinner was a peanut butter sandwich. Um, probably not the best choice. Palette color may not be used. Oh, because I didn't have a default. No, it's gotta be one of these things. Well, actually, no, it doesn't have to be one of these things, but it probably will be one of these things. All right, so this is just going to draw one character. I don't even know if it's going to work, but I'm going to use that code and see if I can draw the whole uh, character set on the screen. 16 by 16, so do Y across. X plus, I don't need to do that. Draw tile, okay, so we'll go up here. <clears throat> we'll just do int tile num equals zero, and then we'll just draw 16 by 16 tiles, tile num plus plus, x times 8, y times 8 should do it. I had to do a few things to make this work. I think we're pretty close though. We're going to do shades of blue, so it should get us pretty close to what it's actually supposed to look like. It'll, it should look recognizable, right? And then here, uh, yeah, we're not going to do the clock stuff. We're just going to Go 16 across, 16 down, and draw 256 tiles. Let's see if it works. Spoiler warning, 
It does work. Although I think we got the brightness backwards. Yeah, that's kind of weird. Like, see how the palm trees look dark there? Huh. It's weird that they would do it like that. But who knows what they were thinking. It was the 80s after all. A decade of decadence and hedonism, you know, completely unlike today, our enlightened society. You know, obviously it's not like that at all. Redrawing, okay, that looks correct. Oh yeah, there we go, I flipped it around, that looks good. Yeah, so we uh, grabbed the data out of an emulator and we put it onto this little microcontroller. But that's just the pattern, so now, can we take the data from the name table and actually say, oh, okay, so we need pattern number 16. It goes in this position. This pattern goes in that position. Actually, that actually that should be quite simple to do. Let's do it next. Uh, let's see here. All right, so we have 30 vertical lines and 32 horizontal lines, although we can't draw the two most, <coughs> I'm sorry, the two rightmost lines. I guess we could just chop them off. So if x is less than uh, 30, 31, if it's less than 30, then actually draw something. Otherwise, as Shania Twain would say, <laughs> whatever you do, don't. <laughs> the unsubscribe button is right down below. I'm gonna go ahead and <laughs> <laughs> Click that and go right ahead. I don't care. Let's change this to a name table pointer. Start it at zero. And we need a 16 bit number. All right, so. Oh, this might increase even if we're not. Yeah. We have to exclude the two most right positions. Yeah, because if we don't. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah, so no matter what, NT pointer will increase, even if the characters aren't being drawn. If we don't do that, there'll be a desynchronization in the vertical layers. That's probably all we need to do to make this work. Let's try it out. NT pointer is a pointer within the name table, so I have to, I have to use the array. Oh, silly zoot, naughty zoot. Yeah, it should be like that. Name table NT pointer. Okay, that should work. Let's send the code over and see what happens. Okay, it's drawing the screen very slowly. Oh, those look like Mega Man clouds to me. And the camera iris changes dynamically. Oh, frozen palm trees. And and someone just texted me. And, oh, wow, look at that. We reconstituted the image. Yay! I. I can totally do this even after drinking uh, six beers, no problem. I'm sure you couldn't help but notice that it drew pretty slowly on the screen. So how can we speed that up? For one thing, we could, uh, we could not set address window for every pixel. That's what the Adafruit library does. Let's just do it once because remember, we have a set size of eight by eight pixels. Right. So let's do <laughs> Sorry, it's inside joke. Uh, start X and then we'll do uh, start X plus seven, start X or start Y plus seven. We'll do that once. Okay, so for each line, we'll load in two lines from the two bit planes that will increment it. Then exposition, okay, we don't need that. <clears throat> All right, so we're gonna do the, you know, eight bits, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I was doing 64? Okay, well, that that's partially my fault for doing that because we just need one pixel. Exposition, I don't believe that matters. Yeah, because if we set the window to eight by eight, It'll do, well, again, if these are the pixels, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Next line, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Remember, it's, it'll do, 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 do. 
Then I'll go, which is kind of cool because we can basically define where all the bits go. So we can create, we can draw in an eight by eight character. And then when we go to the next character, then we change the address window to be eight more to the right. Uh, yeah, so I think that will help us out. But wait a minute, how much was I wasting just by doing 64 to one? I think I can speed this up. For one thing, I had 64 here, whereas it only needs to be one because we're only doing one pixel at a time. Then also in fill area, I had uh, an error. I was, I was decrementing how many pixels before I evaluated it, which is why one didn't work. Oops. And then push program. You can see that it now draws much faster, but still kind of slow. I think we can speed this up yet. Let's go here. Let's set the address window before we do anything. And then instead of setting it to a single pixel like we were before, we'll set it to, oh, eight. eight. Okay, that one is no longer being used. <clears throat> start X, start Y. Start X plus seven, start Y plus seven. Okay, that'll set us up. Set up for an eight by eight tile. So we're still gonna do eight lines, but then we're gonna send this out one at a time. Okay, so blah, 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 blah. So the difference is the fill area. So instead of sending a fill of characters, we're just sending basically one byte at a time. Yeah, DS low, DS high. So let's let's grab this stuff. Let's take it down here. Okay, so let's think about what this is doing. Well, we're putting it into the high speed buffer mode. And then we're also doing chip select so we can write it. But I believe we can just do that one time. So let's go up here. So after we set the address window, which is a command, we're gonna go to, we're gonna go into data mode, which is this right here. High speed data mode. All right, now we're ready for data. So down here, well, how many pixels? Of course, well, we're only sending, we're sending one pixel, which is two bytes. So in this case, what we were passing it with was palette color. So we'll just do that. And that, and then since there's only one pixel, we can remove the while, and like that, remove the fill area, then the part where we slow down or go back to the normal mode of the <clears throat> spy bus, we can remove that because we don't need to do that until we've completed one whole uh, <clears throat> tile. Uh, yeah, does this compile still? Uh, eh, nothing critical. Let's give it a try. Wow, look how fast it drew the screen that time. Uh, yeah, so uh, we made it, you know, we made it work. And then we looked at the code and we're like, okay, how can we speed this up? And then we made it fast. So pretty cool stuff. And let's see, what is this? 6.7 beers in and I'm still rocking it. I got the graphics, now how do I get the palette? Uh, the Nintendo has a famously bad palette. There's only 64 colors to choose from, and a bunch of them are black. I was looking around and actually found this. This is a RGB table of the NES colors. Problem is, this is um, 24 bits per pixel, which is not what our screen uses, so we need to convert it down. We could do it on the fly, but we should probably pre-convert it. So, um, yeah, how do I copy this? Uh, let's see, what else was I looking at? Oh, yeah, yeah, I found this code. How to convert an RGB888 image to RGB565. <clears throat> yeah, it looks like just some C code. This uh, takes a file in and and then outputs one. All right, let's grab this. Don't mind if I do. I'll be having this there worm now then. Oh, wait a minute. Well, no, we need to convert it. Okay, so what we'll do is, uh, I don't think we need this. So x equals, okay, so we don't need that either. <clears throat> we just need an index, which starts at zero. And so x equals index. 
All right, so x equals this return index. So this is going to return a 16-bit value. Okay, that's that's good. Uh, yeah, so red, green, blue. So the difference is instead of having uh, three 8-bit elements, uh, we will bit shift it. So red equals that bit shifted 16. Green equals that bit shifted 8. And then blue equals that and ff. I mean, I could just do this in my code, but I don't want to look. I have a store of 64 32 bit values. That's uh, 256 bytes I'd waste. So, right here, that's where the magic happens. So, RGB 565 means there's five bits of R, six bits of G, and five bits of blue. The reason they give extra bits to G is because humans are more, we can see green better than other colors because of evolution. Okay, the file is saved. Let's go to developer command prompt. This is something you can set up with uh, Visual Studio. Okay, so where is it? Nest color. All right, so CL. All we do is CL, well, assuming that it compiles correctly. And it did. All right, cool. All right, so then uh, now we should have an EXE of Nest color. Yes. Let's run it. All right, now we should have that output file created uh yep there it is 64 entries two bytes per entry size 128 bytes oh for crying out loud i was just last night and i somehow already forgot it i just use s cord or shrek cord or whatever this thing is called oh, okay cat um all right so let's see i need to move that file in here Output RGB. Binary. I was digging around trying to find a way to do this as 16 bits, but I think that might be more trouble than it's worth. So anyway, here it is, the Nest palette. Oh no, my, my code didn't work. These numbers shouldn't look like that. Ah, shoot, I guess I've got to go back and fix the code that I stole. Oh, pfft, I see what I did wrong. Duh. Yeah. 32 RGB 888 pixel equals palette index. Then we just change this to index. Ah, there we go. That looks like the cup of a carpenter. You know, this is <laughs> this is probably the easiest way to do it. I mean, whatever. All right, we're going to have to go in and steal the palette values from Mega Man again. So I'm back on uh, Wiki Nez Dev. Uh, yeah, so here's the palettes. So there's universal background color, so each one of these is only three colors since there's always the same background color. So one, two, three, one, two, three. So three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen. There it is. Now here's what I grabbed from memory. So according to this, the first one is the universal background color. Then we have background palette zero, background palette one, background palette two, background palette three. There it is. I could try applying one of these palettes to the Mega Man screen. It should make the colors look better. And then we can actually decode it uh, meta tile by meta tile. Well, the colors were, were messed up and I thought, oh, maybe I did something wrong. But then I was looking at the S record and I believe it was creating the words in big Endian instead of little Endian. And so by trying to fix it, I actually made it worse. So it was actually easier to go into S record and tell it to output as 16-bit uh, values, and then the data was actually in the proper order. So, well, Endianness is important. It's not Indianness; it's Enddianness. Like, which end of the egg do you crack, and then you go to war over it? Anyway, let me just tweak a few things, and I think we should have uh, the base palettes right. Ah, there we go. We have the right colors for the the ground right there. Now I just need to implement the palette swapping for the rest of it, and then it should automatically color everything. And then down the road, all we can do, or all we have to do, is copy data right from 
The hex editor and the emulator and we'll have everything we need to convert it automatically. Uh, let's do this. Let's go into main. See how it says X times eight. That's, you know, obviously telling where to draw, where to draw it on the screen. Let's pass it X and Y. That way we have the base numbers. This is the last piece of the puzzle. So think of this. Well, this does represent the screen. And then actually each one of these little squares right here, that's two by two um, tiles. So this shows you uh, that the Nintendo can only like, again, like think about Castlevania, how the blocks, you know, are, are beneath your feet. That's a two by two tile. And that's also, so all four of those blocks have to have the same palette. So what they do is they have uh, two bits per meta tile, and then it's one byte per four meta tiles. And the way they arrange it is this diagram here. Uh, this is the last 64 bytes in the uh, name table. Multiply it. Well, we wouldn't multiply it. We'd probably look for if, for if it's even or odd. Do that, then we decide which byte we need to read from the name table, and then we decide what bit, what two bits we need to read from that byte, and that's the palette we use. Everybody got that? <laughs> All right, so yeah, so we see this. So this is one byte. So if it's an even row, we're going to use the upper nibble. If it's an odd row, we're going to use the lower nibble. So what we'll do, we'll say, okay, if it's an even row or not odd row, shift the attribute byte four to the right, which means these four bits will be excluded because we're not using them. And then to decide which pair of bits, we say if positive and if not positive N1, which means an even row, which would be this, then we shift it two more to the right, else we don't shift it. And then when we use our palette selector, what's remain the remainder, which is two bits, we'll use for our index. So we can take those two bits times uh, three, and that's which palette we should use. Yeah, right here we would do, uh, let's call it offset. Offset equals at byte and three plus one. <laughs> okay, and what that will do is that should vector us to the first entry in the uh, game palette. So well, you know, zero, you know, two bits is four. So it's either zero, 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 one, zero, two. I think I have one too many things here. I don't need that many. <laughs> yeah, so it's zero, 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 one, zero, two, zero, three. And this is pointless. Okay, it's still bad, but it, it's failing in a better way. See how this whole section where the ground would be, that's all one color. And then you can kind of see some separation in the palm trees right there. And then the top of it, the clouds, that's all one thing. So it looks like we're getting the separation correctly. The palettes just aren't indexing right. It's probably just some dumb thing I overlooked in the arrays. Oh, uh, I got a bunch of blocks on the screen. I realized I created offset as to where it starts, but then when each one of these colors, I actually have to increment offset so it goes to the next position in memory. Oops, uh, let's see if that fixed it. It did not. Oh yeah, I had this backwards. In my mind, see this? D1, D0, D7, D6. In my mind, I had this basically rotated 180 degrees. Well, that would explain why, well, if I turn on the camera here, that would explain why palette index zero is correct. The blue at the bottom and the other ones are swapped around because I got it wrong. All right, I'll fix it. Oh, wait a minute. I'm thinking about this in logical terms, not physical terms or like memory address. So if we want to index past three, we have to go times four, not times three. So the answer is to make this times four. And then that should finally fix it. And look, a beautifully accurate Mega Man image with like washed out clouds and a washed out tree programmed by a washed up YouTuber. All right, we did it. So, I mean, we should be able to basically just copy that same kind of data from any emulated game and everything should just work. So we can make cool, I mean, I think what I should probably do is, yeah, create a pointer where we just have a block of data and then we just have, instead of having three separate pieces of data, name table, pattern table, palette, we just have one big block. 
And that way, if we could store one or two or three images in this, we could basically uh, vector to it and jump around and change them up on the fly. Okay, so I found some utilities online and I expanded upon it. So what this will do is it will take the file name and also some parameters. So you can set the left or right uh, pattern table. It'll print everything out in one big char file. So it's a lot easier to use, which will also make it easier to use pointers later on. Uh, then you can also set which name table to draw, zero through three. And away we go. So we just replace that dump PPU with that dump PPU. And then it should basically just work. I did a few changes to the code. Uh, in draw tile, I added a pointer uh, for dump PPU. So it's basically I'm being lazy, so I don't have to rewrite all of these arrays. Then the graphics I changed to, well, I'm going to put it in its own section. And there we have it, a perfect Contra image. Nice. Let's get this out on to a tray. I think I had to slap it up here just to be really lazy. So Contra PPU. So you can actually just refer to it by its name. Say my name. So anyway, we're going to do draw nest Contra PPU, which will pass the address to LC. Well, it'll pass. I put this down here too, the, uh, the draw nest, the, the screen drawing routine. Uh, yeah, so it's going to take the pointer, pass that to the tile, and then the counter. And now we should be able to uh, call different screens, uh, in theory. Yeah, so let me, uh, let me render a few more, and then we'll have the screen change every second. Let's see if that works. Now that's a cool clock. Tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock. All right. How many screens? <sighs> Well, it should be 5K. Pretty sure this thing only has 15, I'm sorry, 16K of flash. Kind of disappointed the compiler doesn't actually take that into account. Oh, yeah, sure enough. I tried to add a third screen and it said, whoa, whoa, whoa. no more s'mores. No more s'mores. I thought about trying to make this uh, in one part, but this part is already too long, so Let's just try to finish up the sleep timer, then we'll have to call it quits for today. I've added a few things. I've got a transistor here behind that resistor that will turn on and off the backlight of the screen. I've also added a button here for wake up. So now uh, we should be able to do some current tests using this multimeter and the inline connections. We basically broke the circuit so we can test how much current's being drawn. We need sleep controller. Most of the time a CPU is going to be asleep, especially an embedded one like this, but how do we put it to sleep? Well, we use the sleep command or the sleep register. Let's see, control A, we enable it, and there's also a mode. All right, what are the modes? Idle, standby, power down. Um, so you have to go into a sleep mode that you can recover from. So certain events can wake up certain sleep modes. I think we can probably use power down. Power down is the obviously the lowest power. Real-time counter, okay, we're using that. All right, so I think, yeah, we can use the deepest sleep power down, and it will only be woken up when a second ticks by, which in computer times is actually not that often. <laughs> for an Android, it was an eternity. All right, uh, so for our first test, I think we should grab this register and uh, put it to sleep, and then, well, it'll be woken up by either the button being pressed or a t second being clocked. So we'll put it to sleep right after it draws a Nintendo graphic even though the Nintendo graphic takes a while to draw. <laughs> Maybe that's not the best time to do it. Oh, I, got, I know what we can do. We can hook up the, uh, the backlight. Yeah, so we'll turn the backlight on for like 200 milliseconds, and then we'll put it back to sleep. Yeah, that way we can see something happening, and then we should be able to see the change on the, on the, on the meter. <sighs> Sometimes you really have to guess. Like, I guess slip control? That's maybe that's what... Slip... Oh, there it is. Okay, and then control register A... All right, uh, let's see. So it would be what type of sleep? I'll just put an X. Bit shift one to the right or equals one. Go to sleep. Okay, so power down is two. So yeah, it'd be two bit shift uh, one to the left or one. Let's draw the screen, put it to sleep and then see if it wakes up. Now I just remembered we have to set the backlight to be on. So that's uh, PA2. Uh, I was already working on other projects. Well, we're, we're spooky starting to ship, what is it, Halloween? And, you know, I, I did the firmware for that, so 
That's kind of that kind of took up some brain clocks for me. <laughs> Let's see, port A out set to okay. Ah, for some reason the backlight control isn't working. Let's see. All right, PA two oh four. That should be right. Uh, Oh, that's also being used by Miso, Master In Slave Out. Oh, I wonder if that's preventing it from working as an output. Oh, it probably is. Well, I'll change it to a different wire then. <clears throat> what else? You know what? I don't I don't need you, PA2. Go on, leave. We don't need ya. I never said I was your great leader. Yeah, we well, sure act like it sometimes. Well, you act like a jerk sometimes. Why did Splinter always talk like he was about to have a bowel movement in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? The movie, of course. The real movie. All fathers uh, uh, care for their... Oh, oh, this is quite the loaf. Sons. That was weird. The multimeter went to sleep, but the current kept going through it. Um, I created something called On Time. This is like how many... You know, seconds will stay, the light will stay on. So if uh, so if the seconds get set, yeah. So we'll just wait for five seconds to pass, and then we'll put the thing to sleep. We'll also turn off the backlight. I think we're going to have to turn off additional things. Like I think we might actually have to turn off the LCD circuitry, which there should be a command for. Yeah, this should uh, this shouldn't wake anything up. Oh, wait, no, it would wake something up, which means we'll need to put it back to sleep every time the interrupt triggers. Yep, that was the issue, all right. Oh, look at that. 63 milliamps. Uh, yeah, so if you were to, uh, if you disconnect the backlight, so it's about 9 milliamps, which is still quite a bit. So that's how much the LCD, the LCD circuitry and the microcontroller are consuming. So we want, it, we want that to be even lower. Well, we do have all the commands for the display here in this define file. Look, display on, which we used, display off. Oh. Let's see. I think, was there anything we had to do? I think we had to wait 255 milliseconds. There was no arguments for display on or off, so I think we could just turn it off. Let's see. So we will write command. Well, we'll either tell it to turn on or off. Let's run a test. Okay, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four. Okay. Okay, so the, the backlight turned off. Well, part of it worked, so it did. It definitely timed out the backlight. I don't know. The, I mean, I think there is like thirty-five microamps of quasar current that the power regulator draws. So this we can't get rid of that. I wonder. Uh, I wonder if that's the LCD consuming power. Probably. I wonder if there's like a power down mode we could use. This, it's not saving enough power. This is like in Apollo 13 where it's like, we have to get them back here with the same power that a vacuum cleaner takes. Although a vacuum cleaner back in those days would have, well, they still <laughs> consume a lot of power. Also that movie, they kept saying amps the whole time. I really, I think they would have actually said watts, but 12 amps sounds more dire than 350 watts. Yeah, these are sleep commands. Sleep in puts it to sleep. Sleep out wakes it up. Uh, yeah, maybe we should uh, maybe we should use that instead. Let's see. Uh, so sleep out would be at waking up. Wake up, Mufasa. Uh, let's try it again and go to sleep. Oh yeah, big difference. Uh, five milliamps difference. But we still don't have enough energy to get Kevin Bacon, Bill Paxton. And Tom Cruise, no wait, Tom Hanks home. I disabled the sleep commands in the MCU. I'm not entirely sure they're working. Ah, oh, they aren't. I must have missed something. Ah, oh, wait a minute, I missed this. Select which mode with the register, blah, blah, blah. Then the sleep instruction must be executed to make the device actually go to sleep. Ah, oh, man, it's always in the fine print. Since when is the register not enough? You know, the sleep instruction probably sets some other instruction. You know, uh, okay. Well, read the manual. Oh, I guess I need sleep mode. Sleep mode. All right, fine. I'll I'll add sleep mode. Okay. Taking care of setting the. Oh, I see. Oh, there's just several different ways of doing it. Okay. Well, all right. Let's try sleep CPU. 
Of course, this might just wake right back up after it goes to sleep. Yep, did you see that? So it went to sleep, but then the arc, the timer counted up to one second, and then it woke up again. But did you see, we were down to like what? A tenth of a, a tenth of a milliamp, which, <laughs> which would be uh, 100 microamps. So the catch-22 is when this ISR triggers, it will immediately wake the device up from sleep and then return to the point right after where the device was put to sleep. So I need a way to put the device back to sleep. So since we're using this on time timer, uh, okay, so if on time, five seconds, so like, oh, you know, every time you push a button, it resets it to five seconds. So decrement it, if it hits zero, then turn off the backlight, turn off the display, you know, the LCD display. And then the next time we come back around here in the wall loop, if on time is zero, then we put the CPU to sleep. So what that should do is basically, yeah, so when this thing wakes back up, it'll immediately go into the while one loop. It'll hit this and then go back to sleep, hopefully. I'm never gonna dance again. Can't you see it got no rhythm? Seriously, I always thought it was, can't you see I got no rhythm? Apparently it's guilty feet have got no rhythm. Hey, it worked. Wow, that's really low power consumption. Okay, I switched to microamps. Yeah, 100. Well, it keeps going down. What the heck? So I think this battery, if I had to guess, is probably 50 milliamp hours. We take 50 milliamps, and then we divide that by 0.2 milliamps. 250 milliamp hours divided by 24 means you would only have to charge this thing, assuming you didn't leave the screen running the whole time. You'd only have to charge this thing every 10 days. Not too bad. All right, I'm gonna do a pin change interrupt. So let's create an ISR port A, port vector. And this will be if we push that MISO button or make it go high. At least I, I hope that makes it work. So if that button gets pushed, that will also wake it up from sleep. And then we'll do the following. We will turn the display back on. And then we'll turn the backlight back on out, set, and then that on time thing, set that to five seconds. So then after five seconds, it should, it should turn back off again. Then we have this register pin N control. This inverts the IO and it also sets up the interrupt. So we're gonna want a rising edge. So we're gonna want the value two in this. So pin N control, let's go back, okay. So that would be pin uh, let's see, zero, one, two. Okay, yeah, so that would be port A, pin two, control, I think. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> port, oh, so port A, pin two, control, equals O2. Okay, set rising, edge, int. Oh, I believe we also, I believe we also have to clear the flag so we would write a one to the bit that would be set. So since it's PA2, that would be this one. So that'd be int flag. So when, okay, so port A dit int flags equals, uh, oh, that'd be four actually. Clear int flag. Otherwise it'll keep triggering or it can. It depends on the interrupt and N depends on the CPU. Let's see if this works. All right, let's wait for it to turn off. All right, now it's in sleep mode, and let's do a wakey, wakey, eggs and bakey. And it woke back up. Cool. Uh, although it doesn't seem to be going back to sleep. I must not have cleared the flag correctly, but the important thing is we know that it works. It seems to be working now. I just wasn't clearing the right bit. Oh, yeah, see, every so often you can see it kind of wake up. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, one thousand. Anyway, all right, so the upper left number is gonna count down. Four, three, two, one, zero, it'll turn the screen off again. The other number there is the second, so that was 55, 56, 57, it should be around zero by now, make it back up. Four, five, yeah. It's weird that it, that must be when it wakes up.
ever so briefly. Oh, I know. It's because I, I, I know why it's doing that. I can fix that. Yeah, here in the seconds interrupt, see, we have this thing called sec flag. When we set that, it tells the main loop that it should draw something on the screen. Uh, yeah, so let's only set that flag if on time is enabled. So we're only going to update the screen if, you know, if we're supposed to be able to, if, we're, if the screen is supposed to be on. It's probably why we saw that blip. Let's give it a try. Turning on secondary camera. Uh, doop, boop, a doo. Okay. Okay. Did that get rid of the blip? Looks like it did. Okay, cool. Okay, well, I don't need the current sense for this. I think I'll do a test to make sure that the time is accurate. I'll, uh, I'll let it sleep for about, I don't know, an hour and then see if the hour number changes correctly. And I'll just put in what time it actually is, 7.44. Uh, 7.45 now, I guess. And let's wait an hour and see if it's still accurate. It's been a little over an hour. Right now it's 9.02. Let's see if it's still accurate. Hey, it is! Uh, I saw there was a little bit of an update lag there. Probably have to fix that, but uh, yeah. Timer works. Well, uh, this video is already too long, so I think actually making this into a physical watch is going to have to be in a part two. Uh, in the meantime, I'll probably... Uh, design a little circuit board the same size as the screen and then get it ordered off Osh Park and then we can, uh, you know, make a video talking about how to make this into a watch form factor. So I guess we'll see you in a future video.